Well, thanks everybody for coming. I'm Neil Willardson, I'm the bank's general counsel. And uh, I've been at the bank for 24 years this year, and so I'm really pleased to talk to you about some of the history and purposes of the Federal Reserve System. My goal today is by providing some Federal Reserve history and perspectives from the last 100 years that I'll shed some brighter light on our roles and responsibilities. At the same time, we saw that there's a lot of you folks that have been here before, uh, so we might even have some experts already in areas like monetary policy or, or financial stability or banking supervision or payments. But my goal today is to hope, uh, I hope to sort of bring all these areas together in a framework uh, in understanding more about the Federal Reserve System because that's really what it's all about for these conversations. So we hope to cover today is it's a little bit different than some of our previous town halls. The Federal Reserve noted its 100th anniversary of their formation about a couple weeks ago. Reserve banks were formed in, in, in May of 19, uh, sorry, 1914. So this is really a good time to step back and, and look at that history and understand why the Fed was formed, understand our key roles, and yes, answer some of those key questions like who owns the Fed and how are we organized and are reserve banks part of the government? So begin with the usual disclaimer, I didn't take the time to talk to all my higher ups at the reserve bank here, the board of governors and clear my comments today. So you should know that anything I say today is, are my own words and, and don't represent the Federal Reserve Bank or the board of governors uh, per se. At the same time, most of the information that I'm talking from today is from our websites. Uh, FederalReserveHistory.org is a great website that we put up for our centennial. There's also a lot of other good resources that I put at the back of the presentation that really form the bibliography, so to speak, for the conversation today. Um, the other important disclaimer I should mention is uh, the nature of my expertise. So I'm not a policymaker, I'm a lawyer. Uh, there's going to be people that are going to be much more tuned in to answering those tough questions on the economy. And we have Toby here in case the Q&A uh, gets into that uh, at the end of my talk today. Um, that said, uh, I want to make a pitch for an upcoming presentation. And you saw that in the materials, Sam Schulhofer wool our research director, is going to be doing a town hall on October 9th um, on the topic of understanding employment. And so um, I saw so many hands on previous sessions and I hope to keep that streak going. Uh, hopefully after this session, you'll be enthusiastic to see Sam on October 9th. So let's dive in and turn to the topic at hand. As you might expect, the Federal Reserve Act didn't just happen. Um, most legislation usually comes from a problem and uh, really the formation of the Federal Reserve formed on uh, that sort of problem and, and why it came about in the first place. I want to begin though with some really old history, um, really prior to the Federal Reserve. Uh, the, the country um, also ex previously experimented with the idea of a central bank or a, a national bank uh, with the first bank of the United States and the second bank of the United States. The first bank of the United States was in the late 1700s and the second bank of the United States was in the early 1800s. Both of these banks uh, didn't survive. They were lapsed after 20 years. Uh, they weren't uh, continued, and, and largely that was uh, because of resistance to centralized power. So the country was really without a central bank for, for many years, but like many laws, the Federal Reserve was, was born out of necessity. Uh, during the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, financial panics plagued the nation, leading to bank failures and business bankruptcies that severely disrupted the economy. The failure of the nation's banking system to provide funding to troubled banks during this period contributed to our economic vulnerability to financial panics. The photo there on the left with all the people outside the bank is what you might expect, and that's, that's basically a bank run from 1907. Let me talk a little bit about bank runs in general because it provides some of the context for the role of the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Reserve Act itself. Bank runs are caused by a lack of confidence and ultimately liquidity problem for the institution. And sometimes the financial system as a whole, as we saw in, in 1907, but then also in 2008. Perhaps you remember the scene from A Wonderful Life when George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart, tried to explain to the townspeople that the bank might have their money, but it isn't the vault. It's being invested or lent to the community. You remember it. 
you're thinking of this place all wrong, see? It's, it's as if I had the money right here, back in, back in the safe. The money's not here, see? See, it's in Joe's house, and that's right next to yours, and the Kennedy house, and the maintenance house, and a hundred others. So I'm glad that some of you got. Th thank you. And it's this, this rabbit, he's six feet tall. Uh, no, that, that, that's a completely different movie. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the bank run, and that's how Jimmy Stewart as the banker of Bailey Bank and Trust responded to it. Of course, since FDIC insurance came in in the 1930s, that's really limited the traditional bank runs. We'll see a repeat of financial system runs in 2008, not in banks per se, but of a different kind, and I'll talk about more about that later. Going back to 1907, uh, that crisis resulted from a boom, a peak in the stock market, uh, in 1906, and then later a bust, an economic weak weakening in turn, uh, including a run on several financial institutions. And the picture on the, the right there is of Knickerbocker Trust Company. And that company got in some trouble uh, and failed in October 22. And not only did that bank fail, or that trust company fail, that led to the failure and problems in many other trust companies. There was ultimately uh, concerns about the viability of these firms going forward. And in order to satisfy the demand for cash, these customers, or these companies rather, started to sell their assets and it began basically a fire sale. That fire sale led to a further decline in the stock market, which then began this sort of this circle of, of tragedy for the financial system at the time. That led to uh, large disruptions in other financial markets, not just the stock market. So what happened there is J.P. Morgan, that's a name you might be familiar with, uh, and other financiers basically funded a private bailout of firms at the time, and that ultimately calmed the panics, um, but the panic still resulted in economic slowdown through uh, much of 1908. So what happened then is Congress became concerned. There were a, sort of, 1907 was uh, the, uh, the last at the time of a number of pretty severe financial panics and busts and booms, and they said, you know, we should establish this, this uh, organization or this group called the National Monetary Commission. And the purpose of this commission is really to study what governmental type reaction there should be to crises. So this group um, was originally chaired by Nelson Aldrich, who was the chair of the Senate Financial Committee. And he summoned, uh, he, he worked with Congress initially to try to come up with some options for essentially a central bank. The problem uh, was that there really was a wide disagreement about what should be done. Should it be private, should it be public? There was a whole range of discussions that just didn't uh, bear fruit. And that led to Jekyll Island. And so when you hear about the Fed conspiracy theories, uh, Jekyll Island often comes up. So I wanna directly address that. So what Nelson Aldrich did, um, he uh, summoned a bunch of private bankers and they got on a train, and they originally went uh, to uh, the Georgia coast, and they went to a place called Jekyll Island. There's actually a picture of Jekyll Island right there at the bottom, and it's a pretty nice, fancy resort. And these bankers, um, it was such a secretive meeting that they used assumed names for the entire meeting and on the way there. And um, it was on the pretense of a duck hunting trip. And they basically all got together and put together what they thought would be an appropriate blueprint for a central bank at the time. Now the group attempted to develop a very decentralized system of nationally chartered banks that would be run by, as you might expect with a group of bankers, a bunch of private banks uh, to form the central bank. There was essentially no governmental involvement or process for what this, this Jekyll Island group came up with. Now, that I, those set of ideas, along, of, uh, along with a bunch of other ideas, started to sort of uh, uh, percolate within Congress. And um, it was pretty clear the Democrats at the time thought this idea of a, 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 uh, an only privately run central bank, sort of an extension of the J.P. Morgan model to some extent, wasn't going to work. In fact, the Democrats said, you know, we should have a government-only central bank, um, like, some other, uh, uh, like some other countries at the time. And they were only willing to accept a central bank if it involved uh, more governmental control. So then there was a plan proposed by Carter Glass, who was the chairman of the House Committee of Banking and Currency at the time, that mixed both private and public control. So you brought the private part, some of the elements of the Jekyll Island group, along with the public uh, concept of a, a central bank. 
And that mixture was ultimately accepted. And so the Federal Reserve Act was written to reduce the influence of bankers at the local level and to create the Board of Governors as a public agency to oversee the banks. So after the, the debate, the Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act and President Woodrow Wilson signed it in, on December 23rd, 1913. And the act isn't very long. Um, in fact, I have a copy right here if anybody wants to read it. It's, it's a little longer than the Constitution, I suppose, but it's only about 110 pages. And this is as amended. So um, pretty much everything about the mission of the Federal Reserve is contained in this relatively short document. It does contain really all the core major Federal Reserve functions. It provides for both the governmental part, the Board of Governors, as well as the Reserve Banks. If you look at the purpose of the act as it was posed back in 1913, and this is still part of the act, you see some of those core elements and the driving forces behind the creation of the Federal Reserve System. So I wanna walk through a couple of these things and, you can, and I'll, see, I'll show you in a minute how these translate to the current powers and authority of the Federal Reserve System. The first was really a reaction, the furnishing of an elastic currency to this boom and bust concern that people had about the central bank at the time. And it was one of the main purposes for why the Fed was formed. And again, there were financial panics and seasonal demand for currency. And that a large, remember, we had an agricultural society at the time. There was agricultural cycles that led to booms and busts in the markets at the time that would leave banks strapped for cash and unable to fulfill but demands from their depositors. Some of the issues associated with currency had been addressed by the National Banking Act in 1863 that created the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and allowed uh, currency to be issued by national banks rather than state banks. However, without a, ce a central bank, the supply of currency didn't expand and contract as easily as quickly as it could, and the banknote system was very fragmented, and it was cumbersome to issue new banknotes. There was also no easy way to move reserves around the country, and that also that ended up causing or worsening panics. The second part about re rediscounting commercial paper, I just want to talk about that a little bit. Commercial paper is basically a a term for a short-term obligation that's used in trade. And the discounting and rediscounting of commercial paper was a way to provide liquidity to the financial system. So when the financial system needed funds, that provided a safety valve. And as you think about it today, it's sort of a rough and ready way to think of the lending authority of the Federal Reserve. You see effective supervision of banking, and I'll talk about that in a minute. That continues to be a, a key role of the Federal Reserve System. And then other purposes, and it wasn't really clear what other purposes were meant at the time in the few years after the, uh, the, for, the, the Federal Reserve was formed, though, in 1913, 1915, 1916, you saw that reserve banks were getting heavily into check clearing processes. So the Federal Reserve took a pretty heavy role in the payment system. So now when we turn to how we frame these current functions of the Federal Reserve System, you see a lot of those strong parallels that go back to that 1913 law. You see the conduct of monetary policy, the stability of the financial system, the regulation and supervision of financial institutions, and the provision of uh, financial services to depository institutions. Before I dive into each of those four things, though, I want to provide that framework that I promised. The Act created a unique central bank, and regional offices like this one are located across the country under the leadership of local directors, blended with oversight from the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. So this creates that public-private partnership it mirrors the value that Americans place on the regional distribution of responsibility and the importance of checks and balances. So let's answer that question now. Is the Federal Reserve part of the government? Well, the Board of Governors is. It's an executive agency, but the Reserve Banks aren't. These dynamics are captured in this picture with some important overlays, as you'll hear about more tonight. The Fed was and remains politically independent. At the same time, the Fed's accountable to Congress and the public and transparent in its obligations to meet its public mission. So now I turn to that government part, the Board of Governors. And at the same time you see government in the Board of Governors, you also see the desire to reduce political influence. And that really shows up in the term of office. So with a 14-year term, as you might expect, there's less political influence with the folks that are appointed to the Board of Governors in the first place. They're appointed by the President and they're confirmed by the Senate. And they have responsibilities at the Board, like guiding the monetary policy action of the country, the chair of the Federal Open Market Committee, Janet Yellen, is the current chair as of February 1st, 2014. Uh, she testi uh, provides testimony before Congress. They analyze economic and financial conditions. They have supervisory authority, responsibility for the financial services industry. 
They oversee the nation's payment system and oversee the activities of reserve banks less, like us here in Minneapolis. And here's a picture of the Board of Governors. Um, and um, I will say that this is the chart that's uh, changed the most <laughs> over the last couple, couple weeks because there's been uh, some recent appointees and also a recent departure from the Fed. The one that you're, of course, familiar with is Janet Yellen, the chair of the Federal Reserve. She's the first woman to hold the position, and her official duties began as chair on February 1st. Prior to being the chair, Janet Yellen was the vice chair from 2010 to 2014. And prior to that, she served as a president of the San Francisco Fed from 2004 to 2010. So she brings a great deal of experience to the role. Other members of the Board of Governors include uh, Jay Powell to the left, Dan Tarullo in the middle, and the most recent appointee is uh, Stanley Fisher, who was former governor to Israel's central bank. Jeremy Stein uh, just left the board yesterday, and that's what I'm talking about. I have to change this thing uh, as of today, um, to return to his position, at, teaching position at Harvard. And there's also a, an, a, uh, an individual that has been uh, appointed by the president but not confirmed by the Senate, and that's Lael Brainerd. So um, this might change in the coming weeks. But right now we have four members of the Board of Governors. So now let's turn to the, uh, I'll say the private part, although we certainly have a public purpose, and that's the Federal Reserve Districts. And people that come here probably expected, uh, that if you know a little bit about the Fed, you know that there are 12 Reserve Districts. Uh, the Act, surprisingly, doesn't say 12. Instead, it says something between 8 and 12. And how did we get to 12 is sort of an interesting story. The Act does refer to a Reserve Bank Organization Committee. And at the time, this consisted of three people who back in 1913 and 1914 had the uh, job of figuring out first whether it's going to be 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, or 12, I should say, stop there, and where those uh, reserve bank cities and how those districts would be um, divided. And these individuals included the um, Secretary of the Treasury, the Secretary of Agriculture, I think because ag was so important at the time, and the Comptroller of the Currency. And there wasn't much other guidance in the act for this committee to figure out where those districts should be drawn, except there was a note that said, um, the district shall be apportioned with due regard to the convenience and customary course of business and should not necessarily be coterminous, coterminous with any state or states, meaning that it doesn't have uh, some states like we have in this district, uh, Michigan and Wisconsin could be cut in a couple of different places. And for example, we share Michigan and Wisconsin with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. So what did the organization do? Well, they conducted hearings in 18 cities and heard from 37 cities who hoped to be Federal Reserve cities. And uh, the way to think of this is kind of like um, the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, who wants to be the Super Bowl or the Olympics or uh, political conventions? People basically put in their pitches for uh, being a Federal Reserve city. Um, and it was interesting that the uh, discussion for this, the presentations took place in Chicago. Chicago was pretty much guaranteed a bank. And um, there was a question whether it would be 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. And it wasn't clear that the upper Midwest would have a bank at all. In fact, it was thought maybe that we would have a branch here rather than a full reserve bank. Um, the paper at the time, the, called the Minneapolis Journal, uh, stated the contest uh, like this. It said, uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul contest transcends in importance anything in the history of the composition of the two cities in the last 25 years. So this is a, this is a pretty big deal. And right off the bat, it was pretty clear that Minneapolis had the better prospects. The Minneapolis Civic and Commerce Association put out a really glossy um, piece of material about why Minneapolis should be chosen for the Reserve Bank City. And interestingly enough, the person who put that together was from the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> and you might wonder, well, why was that? And it was because the president of the University of Minnesota at the time said, you know, I don't want any of our professors favoring Minneapolis or St. Paul, so you're going to have to get somebody else to do that. So that's why somebody from the University of Wisconsin put together the pitch book for Minneapolis. So they went to the hearing, and it was a pretty contentious deal, and people thought that Minneapolis made a pretty big slip up because they attacked uh, St. Paul's economic vitality. Um, and in the headline, you can see that Minneapolis was chastised by the committee for it. And as the hearing went on, Minneapolis indicated uh, during the hearing, well, if we can't have the regional bank, then why don't you go ahead and have it in Chicago? Uh, 
Um, St. Paul, on the other hand, showed a little bit more of a, a, a sense of citizenship, and they said, you know, if we don't get it, we'd be okay if Minneapolis did. So I don't know exactly what the thinking was behind the organization committee, but ultimately I think we know where this ended up, and that is uh, the Minneapolis Reserve Bank, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank up in the upper Midwest was uh, cited here in Minneapolis. There was also similar discussions, as you might expect, around the rest of the country, but that's probably the one that's most interesting to all of us. And la that led, those discussions, that Reserve Bank Organization and Committee led to this uh, current map of how the Federal Reserve System is organized, and you so see all the 12 Federal Reserve districts. Reserve banks operate under the Board of Governors' uh, supervision in Washington. They are private and independent corporations. Each reserve bank has a nine-member board of directors. Another way that we're not government is that the Federal Reserve System budget is not appropriated. Instead, Federal Reserve banks generate their own income. We generate that from interest on government securities that are acquired in the course of our monetary policy responsibilities. Now, a secondary source of income that we have is derived from our price services activities. That's where we essentially act as a banker's bank to financial institutions. But while we're privately held, we're really not operated for, for profit. Instead, we happen to make a pretty good profit, and we have over the last few years because of large holdings of securities. In fact, in, in 2013, we returned just short of $80 billion to the U.S. Treasury. I think it was $79.6 billion to the U.S. Treasury as a result, largely as a result of that, uh, the assets that we hold in our portfolio in a bit because of the funds from our um, financial services activities that we provide for banks. So the, these reserve banks opened on November 21st, 1914, and we have traditional corporate powers. Um, there are technically stockholders. So I said, well, we're... we're, we're we, we, we're not appropriated, we provide our profits, so what are these stockholders doing? I'll talk about that in a second. Before I do, I should mention, when we started, we only had eight employees. Uh, now we have around 1,100. It's about uh, 50 in the Helena branch, and I'll talk about that in a second, about 1,050 here in Minneapolis. We are subject to oversight by Congress, uh, but we are in nonpartisan. Uh, we act as depository for banks in our district, Again, the Board of Governors has oversight responsibility for us. So let's now turn to this, this stock certificate. This is actually a picture of one of the stock certificates back from 1907. And as part of uh, the Federal Reserve Act, uh, member banks are required to own stock in the Federal Reserve System. So they buy stock, capital stock in the Federal Reserve System for which they receive a dividend. Uh, it happens to be 6%. It's a statutory dividend and has to be paid to those districts. But they don't own the Federal Reserve in any conventional sense. In fact, they don't own the Federal Reserve at all. They just are simply receiving a statutory dividend from us. For example, if the Federal Reserve were ever to liquidate, or again, those profits that go back, those profits don't go back to those, those banks that have stock certificates with us. Instead, they go back to the public in the order of, again, last year, about $80 billion dollars. So the Federal Reserve, if you think about the ownership, is really owned by us as the public. So how are we governed and managed by the reserve banks? Like other corporations, we have directors, and they're providing a public service as they're all outside directors. So we have nine directors, and I'm first going to show you the statutory way that the directors serve us and how they're selected. And um, who they represent. So on the far left there, you see what's the A, the people that are uh, directors that are designated class A directors. They represent commercial banks that are members of the Federal Reserve District. There's also three class B and three class C members that represent the public. And the way the definition of the statute says is, is with due but not exclusive consideration to the interests of agriculture, commerce, industry, service, services, labor, and consumers. So a broad swath of economic activity is to be covered. And the member commercial banks uh, elect those class A and class B members, but only the A's are bankers, and the B's are public members, and the B's and C's there cannot be an employee or officer of any bank. So only three can be bankers, three of the non-bankers are elected by bankers, and those others, those class C's, are appointed by the Board of Governors in Washington. Boy, that's complicated, right? That's all in the Federal Reserve Act, and so we go through this process, and people can uh, serve two, three-year terms if they're class 
uh, B or C directors or and one, one three-year term if they're Class A directors. Now those Class C directors, in addition to being appointed by the Board of Governors and they can't be an employee or officer or have any affiliations with a bank or a director of a bank, they can't even own stock in a bank. So they can't even own public company stock in a large financial institution. So that's those Class C directors. So now let me put the pictures up here. This is our current directorate. And those of you that might have walked in the uh, room today saw a picture of our, our uh, 2014 board of directors. Typically, their uh, CEOs or presidents or they, they have a substantial title within their organization. And, and again, this is their 2014 board. You might recognize a few of these names. For example, our three Class C directors are Randy Hogan of Pentair, Ken Powell of General Mills, and Michael Hong of, of a Wilder Foundation. We also look, of course, beyond Minnesota, given the span of our district. So you see Larry Simpkins from Montana, Christine Hamilton from South Dakota, Randy Newman, and uh, Howard Dahl from North Dakota, and then Ken Palmer from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. These directors provide oversight for our bank, but also assist considerably in providing economic and business and financial information about what's going on. And that information is used by our president, Nariana Coach Lakota, when he goes to the FOMC meetings and provides our view of what's going on in the Ninth Federal Reserve District and ultimately the views on what should happen with respect to monetary policy. So they provide oversight, their perspectives on conditions, but also a, a form an important link to their community because again, we're spanning all the way from Montana all the way to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. This governance approach assures local perspectives and expertise and accountability. So we've talked about the director, they've talked about the Board of Governors, talked about the directors of the Reserve Banks. Let me just say a few words about what we do here at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis and how that links back to our purposes and functions. Again, the Reserve Banks essentially be, consider them sort of the operating arms of the central bank. And in the first uh, form of our mission, how do we help formulate and implement monetary policy? Our bank president, Nariana Coach Lakota, participates in the FOMC meetings. And this year is one of those voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee. That, uh, that it ultimately sets a monetary policy for the country. Uh, we maintain the financial stability of the, of, the, of, the, of the financial system. And the way we do that, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is through the discount window. For example, during 9-11, 2001, there were some severe disruptions in the financial system. Likewise, in 2008, there were some uh, considerable liquidity issues in the financial system. So we have a, a discount window or a way to lend and you refer, saw back to the purposes of the original act that deal, talks about discounting and rediscounting of money or of uh, paper. Lending provides that same safety valve and we do that through the discount window. We supervise uh, state member banks and bank holding companies in our district. So if you think about the largest financial holding company in our district is US Bancorp. We have examiners that are responsible for the oversight of that organization at the holding company level. At the same time, we supervise some of the smallest banks in the district, some of those small banks in Montana, North Dakota, state member banks, that we have examiners go in and look at the safety and soundness of those organizations. They evaluate the consumer compliance of those organizations, essentially kick the tires to make sure that that organization is being run in an effective manner. And then finally, we provide um, services for the financial system. Uh, we distribute cash. For those of you that went on the tour, you saw the, the cash area. You can see the cash coming in, the cash going out. Um, here in Minneapolis, we run the automated clearinghouse system or the ACH system for the entire country. And then we also um, uh, provide retail treasury services on behalf of the U.S. Treasury for the purchase and sale of bonds and notes. So if you're a, a retail customer that has those items and you call somebody for help on that item or you want to buy or sell or... Um, you have a question about the security, we have a customer service operation right here in Minneapolis that not only serves this district, but the entire country for that function. We also have a branch out in Helena, Montana. The Federal Reserve Act provided that the Board of Governors could form branches, and the board did that uh, to a great extent in 1919 or so. It wasn't until 1921 that the Helena branch got, their, got a branch, and it's the smallest city to have one. Um, our operations out there are very small. I mentioned we have about 50 folks out there. It includes cash distribution, outreach. We have bank examiners out there as well. You can see a picture of the branch today and then the original location in 1921. Um, I mentioned the little advertisement about, uh, for this session, if anybody clicked on the video, that there is something of a link between the Helena branch and the gangster um, 
uh, John Dillinger. Um, so I'll tell that story right now. Um, in 1930, um, their branch had to add two security guards to our group of five. And the reason was is that Dillinger had um, taken up shop and had rented a room across the street from the branch. And the concern was that, uh, that he was going to rob the branch. And why did they think that? Even though you, you look at here and you see all this great security, at the time, people were uh, using the branch and they were bringing in gold. Um, and they could actually trade gold uh, for cash at the time. And, um, and so Dillinger and others thought that this was a ripe opportunity to, to rob the branch. And uh, fortunately, the, hopefully it was, you know, maybe it was the additional show of force with the additional law enforcement officers, or maybe he decided uh, not to do it, or maybe he was just on vacation. I don't know. But, but in any case, uh, the, the robbery never materialized, and, uh, and all is well out in the Helena branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Here's a picture of our branch directors, and uh, here we have five directors, and they're advisory directors. They don't have a governance or fiduciary responsibility like those directors here, uh, but they do provide valuable insight on business and economic conditions about what's going on in Montana in particular and in, the, in their industries as well. Two of those folks, remember there was three uh, directors in Minneapolis here that are appointed by the Board of Governors, and Helena, two of them, our deputy chair and our vice chair, uh, or our deputy chair and our chair, are appointed by the Board of Governors, and the remainder are appointed here by the directors at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. So now I'm going to take a walk through, as promised, those functions of the Federal Reserve System and give sort of a historical context for how those have changed over the years. And I'm going to begin with the, probably the one you think about the most when you hear about the Federal Reserve, and that's the conduct of monetary policy. A couple ways to think about this is the structure of monetary policy, and that is, I'll give you the the bottom line on that one, that's both the Board of Governors and the Reserve Banks participate in the conduct of monetary policy. And then also um, the goals of monetary policy. And this is where there's been changes in both over the years. So that's what I'm going to try to highlight today is the goal now, um, as specifically as of 1978, is very explicit to promote maximum employment and price stability. But both that structure and the goals have changed over time. Here's a picture of the current FOMC and how the Federal Open Market Committee, I use that term FOMC so fast it just rolls off the tongue, but you probably have heard it yourself. Um, that's, the, that's the body that works and forms the practices and policies for monetary policy in the country. That's made up of those seven members of the Board of Governors, currently four members of the Board of Governors. It always includes, the voting members always include the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and the remaining four votes are rotated among the Reserve Bank presidents, and you probably can't read it very well, but um, we're in year three, sorry, year two right now, and so Niriana Coach Lakota is one of the voting members of the FOMC. Um, now, just because uh, you're not a voting member, and uh, for example, we rotate with Kansas City and San Francisco, those presidents still show up for the meetings, so they still have to show up, uh, and they provide their views. But when it comes to the monetary policy actions, those things that you read about uh, on those Wednesdays af Wednesday afternoons, they're not, uh, they're not voting on those actions. Um, the interesting thing about this rotation and part of the thing that got me interested in doing this kind of presentation after I did a little research myself is it hasn't always been this way. So you always think, wow, the FOMC is always formed. There's these governors that vote and these presidents that vote and they rotate. Uh, no, it hasn't always been that way. And in fact, from the very beginning in 1913, um, there wasn't an FOMC. Uh, there really wasn't a, a, a formal process initially for open market operations. And instead, and originally it was a voluntary committee. We have a lot of committees in the Federal Reserve System, and this one started as a voluntary committee. Um, and it consisted of New York, Cleveland, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Boston in the mid-20s. And then uh, the Board of Governors said, you know, all 12 reserve banks should participate in 1930. And then uh, the government itself, Congress thought, well, we should make this more formal. We should, we should make it part of the law. So in 1933, they said, well, let's make this part of the Federal Reserve Act. There's a big change in 1935. And as you might expect, given the timing, it's around the time after the midst of the Great Depression, they said, boy, you know, reserve, there should be others involved besides reserve banks in this process. So um, discussions took place. And in this case, they said, well, Let's have the seven Board of Governors members uh, be part of that rotation, part of the FOMC composition voting members, and then five reserve banks can 
uh, rotate in a schedule. New York at that time was not their own voting member, uh, did, not, did not have uh, their own space. In other words, they didn't vote every, every year. And instead, New York was alternating with Boston. But what happened between 1935 and 1942 was the directors basically decided who would vote, New York or Boston. And every year, New York voted. So Congress got wind of that and said, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Boston has a reserve bank. They should be represented in the FOMC. So they changed the rotation group to in 1942 and said, OK, let's change this. We understand the importance of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. They should be a permanent member. Boston, Philadelphia, and Richmond start rotating. Cleveland, Chicago get to rotate every other year. So every other year, they're, they're um, uh, voting members in the FOMC. And then the remaining banks rotate in groups of three. So once again, it is sort of interesting, I think, that FOMC has really wasn't around the very beginning and has changed, but really since 1942 has pretty much been like it is. The goals of monetary policy have also evolved. So the structure changed, the goals have also changed. And the original focus of monetary policy was about financial stability. But there were a lot of questions about what that entailed back in 1913. What do we do? Um, the early histories noted that with respect to monetary policy, there was little information about how the Fed might accomplish this mission, what tools should be used, and how should they be used. It was clear that price stability or avoiding high inflation was a historic focus of monetary policy in the United States, but not so much for economic growth. Historians, including Alan Meltzer, one of the most prominent, noted that stable growth was not part of the Federal Reserve's formal mandate in the early years, most of the system's leadership at the time would have denied responsibility for economic activity or employment. But over time, I think people began to understand, policymakers began to understand not only on price stability or the lack of inflation, but also about this concept of employment. And we should be thinking about the overall growth in the economy. It really wasn't until 1978 where that became more formal as part of the Humphrey Hawkins Employment Balanced Growth Act, when America was struggling with the twin plagues of high employees, uh, unemployment and high inflation or stagflation. And of course, this is a picture of our own Hubert Humphrey, uh, one of the two sponsors of the act. In 1978, brought forward this dual mandate. So 1978 puts the dual mandate as part of the specific uh, Federal Reserve Act. And so this is when you first see the language of the act say, the goal is to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. There were a number of other provisions that were contained in that Humphrey-Hawkins Act, and that included, again, this dual mandate, but also requiring the Fed chair to appear before Congress uh, semi-annually. This is a transparency concept, and also requires the Board of Governors to issue a written report to Congress regarding its monetary policy. Now, the dual mandate remains the clearest statement in the Federal Reserve Act regarding the purpose of monetary policy. So now let's turn to financial stability. And again, this goes back to the 1907 time frame and ultimately the purpose of the Federal Reserve Act and how the Fed seeks to help maintain the stability of the financial system, preventing liquidity crisis, bank failures, and other disruptions that could potentially undermine people's confidence in the financial system. Before 2008, I think people, the way people thought about this was the power of the reserve banks to lend a depository institution at the time of individual firm strains or broader strains of liquidity in the financial system. Our supervisory and regulatory role so that we go in and kick the tires of individual institutions and ultimately have a better understanding about what's happening more systemically in the financial industry. There was also a little used authority that would come up later in 2008 called Section 13.3 13, 13 of the Federal Reserve Act. This was not part of the original act, but was added in, in 1932, where it said, under exigent circumstances, the Fed could lend to individuals, partnerships, and corporations. So let me touch on a couple of these items in particular. This is from our website that speaks to the discount window. And the discount window really functions as a safety valve for institutions. It helps relieve liquidity strains for individual depository institutions in the banking system as a whole as providing a backup source of authority. As you might expect, banks have ways of getting lending, to lend among each other and receiving overnight funding from each other. But there's times when those funding markets aren't working effectively and the Fed does extend credit to banks overnight um, and potentially for longer terms. Uh, if we have good collateral 
and legals that support the, that lending. Um, and originally, the lending reserve fund funds were intended to be a principal instrument of central banking operations. It's largely been superseded by the open market operations that are done by the New York Fed, but it still plays a role and had a pretty big impact, of course, of course during the Great Recession in 2008. On an ongoing basis, we really have three kinds of programs, and they're circled there. It's pretty small and hard to read. One's called the primary credit program, and this is if banks need to, to borrow from us, they're in the they're in good financial condition, they have good capital position. If they need to borrow from us, they sort of get the, the best rate. It's still an above market rate, but they get the best rate from us. You can also, um, if you're not eligible for primary credit, you can get secondary credit from the Federal Reserve. Um, and then finally, seasonal credit. And this applies pretty particularly to areas like here in the Minneapolis Fed and the Kansas City Fed, which assists small depository institutions in managing seasonal swings due to agriculture production. So I'm going to take a moment to talk about the supervisory and regulatory role of the Fed and begin with pre-2010. And I mentioned this role when I talked about the role of the Fed playing in, in supervising financial and bank holding companies, state member banks. Other entities here are called agreement corporations, edge act corporations. Again, what we do here is we work with other regulators. There's uh, in, the, in the country, there's actually a range of financial industry regulators. There's a Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation that supervises state non-member banks. There's the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency that supervises national banks. Um, there's also state banking supervisors that share supervision with the FDIC and the Fed. So there's sort of a patchwork of regulators that supervise financial institutions for safety and soundness and for consumer compliance. The role of the Fed, though, would expand um, after uh, the 2010 time frame, and that's with the Dodd-Frank uh, Act, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Before I do, I want to just touch on this financial services role. The bankers in the room are probably pretty familiar with our role here, and I mentioned our ACH function that's done here at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, as well as the Treasury services role. And the act really, as I mentioned earlier, only briefly mentions that the payments activity of the country, but there were amendments, particularly in 1980, where we opened up our financial services, not only to, to member banks, but uh, banks more broadly, and they pay for that service. And we sometimes refer to the Fed as a banker's bank, and that means that the Fed provides uh, services to bank the same kind of services that you receive. So you can uh, borrow money, um, you can deposit money, um, and the Fed works the same way. When financial institutions need cash, they can order currency. They have to pay for it, uh, but they can order currency from us. And when they have excess cash, they deposit it with us, as you saw some of you that took the tour here earlier today. And that's one of the real important roles that we, pay. Uh, we play here at the Fed in Minneapolis and Helena. I remember around the time of, um, of the, uh, the 1999, 2000, I've already forgotten the century date change, uh, we had a lot of excess cash because there were a lot of people concerned uh, that there might the cash machines not, might not work. So we had a lot of excess cash in our uh, vault at the time. Other financial services that we provide are this ACH or automated clearinghouse transactions, which are electronic credit and debit transactions. These are the kinds of transactions that get you your direct deposit from your paycheck every couple weeks, or wire transfers between financial institutions. That's managed um, through the New York Fed. Not all reserve banks provide these services. Much like other financial institutions, we've consolidated large parts of our operation. We used to have 300 check people here in Minneapolis. We don't have any anymore. Uh, those are managed through only a couple of reserve banks in the country due to consolidation, but also significant changes in technology. Um, the Fed also provides financial services to the U.S. government. In this role, again, we process the U.S. savings bonds and maintain accounts for the U.S. Treasury. And, and we're the sole consolidated site here in Minneapolis for retail treasury securities. So let's talk about the crisis and how the role of the Federal Reserve was altered and changed during that period. You see some of these words that sound a little like 1907 and 1929 and 1930, 31, 32, 33, the Great Depression. Bubble, bust, financial firm failure, liquidity crisis. Some of those echoes of 1907, the 1929 crash and Great Depression, but I think there were some key differences. I'll talk about those in a second here. The Federal Reserve Act provided some of the infrastructure to support a more uh, a quick response and a better recovery from the situation. And also under the uh, leadership of Chairman Bernanke and the rest of the board at the time, 
The lessons learned from the Great Depression led to aggressive monetary policy action and innovative liquidity programs. And so I'm going to talk about both of those things on the monetary policy side and on liquidity programs as well. So first, what did the Fed do during 2008? Is we took strong monetary policy action during the crisis. We cut and maintained those short-term interest rates, and they remained very close to zero. And in the aftermath, really shortly after 2008, when we began to make unconventional asset purchases to drive down long-term interest rates, that led to a significant increase in the balance sheet and what's called quantitative easing. First, I want to just touch on those innovative programs um, that, in, that ease liquidity. And uh, Luann Peterson and I wrote an article. I wrote initially one in late 2008, I think December 2008, and then another one in 2010, we walk through really the effects of each of these programs and how they helped ease the credit markets in the various those, of those areas. But here is sort of the, the range of activities, the range of liquidity programs that took place in 2008. And remember that little known section of the Federal Reserve Act called Section 13.3, where the Fed could lend to individuals, partnerships, and corporations that was really rarely, if ever, used. It was used a lot in 2008. And these are the programs that came out of that part of the Federal Reserve Act. So not only the traditional programs under the discount window that support banks and the term auction facility kind of falls into that category, there were a wide range of financial markets that were having problems. These were primary dealers, commercial paper, money markets, broader market participants. A whole range of issues were taking place, and this is probably another town hall. Maybe you've seen this before. You've probably read a few books about the crisis. Uh, but there were considerable challenges in the credit markets, and the Fed felt like they, we had to step up and provide liquidity to markets that were essentially shutting down. And the concern was that various financial industry segments and firms had to they need to pay obligations, but their assets couldn't be liquidated, liquidated quickly enough, and they wouldn't ultimately meet the obligations that they had and had all firms needed and tried to liquidate the assets at the same time the markets would have collapsed. So we use those powers under Section 13.3 to create a variety of these lending programs where the Fed lent with good collateral and appropriate legal agreements so they'll be secured. And ultimately, in our article, we talk about this, and certainly policymakers do a better job of talking about this, but those programs help keep the financial system functioning well and bought some time to allow for more orderly unwinding of assets where necessary. The thing I'll mention about these programs is that um, you know, they were very controversial at the time and probably in some ways are still controversial, but all the money was paid back. There wasn't a single nickel lost on those lending programs by the Federal Reserve System. And so ultimately they made money for the Treasury because, again, lent, uh, money was lent, interest was paid, charged and paid, and money went back to the U.S. Treasury from those programs. But boy, oh boy, uh, those, uh, the balance sheet looked a lot different uh, during that time. So this picture shows... On the left there, you can see the typical balance sheet back in 2007. It still seems like a big number, but our balance sheet at the time, those assets that we have, largely treasury debt securities, repurchase agreements, the typical things that we have for monetary policy purposes was around 700 billion. That's a big number. But all of a sudden, you see all those programs during that 2008 timeframe kick in during this time of crisis where more liquidity had to be provided to the markets. So you see those programs supporting banks. You also see currency swaps. Uh, but these other programs involving money market mutual funds, primary dealers, and you also see those a that AIG loan program. There was a considerable uh, lending program to an individual firm that was systemically important. So that was a huge change for the country. And, and you saw the ballooning of the Fed balance sheet up to basically almost $2.5 trillion during that time. Fast forward here to today, that red box shows those lending programs, and you say, boy, there's, those lending programs are gone, but the Fed's balance sheet is still up there. In fact, now it's up over $4 trillion. Well, what's that all about? That goes back to those monetary policy actions that were taken following the crisis. And so the Fed's approach to monetary policy has really evolved since 2008, and again, we had a, a, a near zero target range for the Fed funds rate, but we greatly expanded. See, all those lending programs are gone, but you see other aspects of the balance sheet growing and continuing to grow. 
And what that is, we heard the term quantitative easing or bond buying program. That's what that is. The goal there of buying those continuing assets, having the Fed continue to buy those assets, is to put downward pressure on longer term interest rates and support economic growth and activity by making financial conditions more accommodative. And this ties back to this dual mandate concept that we should be focused on certainly price stability, but right now that's not an issue, but economic growth and employment is an issue. So the Federal, the Federal Open Market Committee has said we need to continue these activities to, um, to buy bonds and buy treasury securities and other aspects of the, of the assets to um, continue the policy of, of uh, putting downward pressure on longer term interest rates. Now, in December 2013, the Federal Reserve announced it would modestly slow the pace of additional mortgage-backed securities and other long-term Treasury security purposes, uh, purchases and further reduce the pace of asset purchases and measure steps. And that's assuming if the in incoming information showed ongoing improvement in labor markets. So you really can't see it here because while the idea was to reduce the amount that's purchased every month, the purchases are still continuing. So over time, you will see this level out and eventually drop down. But for now, the purchases still continue while we're still combating this question and issue of ongoing unemployment. So lots of things going on with liquidity programs and monetary policy. And at the same time, Congress, correctly so, was concerned about um, the potential for future future crisis, and, the, and so they passed a much bigger law than the Federal Reserve Act. Remember, I talked about 120 pages. Well, Dodd Frank is about a thousand pages, and the purpose of Dodd Frank is really multiple. One of them is to combat this too big to fail problem, and to try to reduce the prospects of future crises, um, and the the other is to really better protect consumers in in this context. Um, the, there was act actions taken as part of Dodd-Frank to hopefully strengthen the financial services industry. Among other things, Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act provided for orderly uh, resolution authority. The idea that if you provide a better process for the resolution of large firms, we'd be more likely to undertake that rather than worry about and, and bail out those large institutions. There was also um, uh, the, uh, a group that was formed, an interagency group that was formed, the financial the, called the FSOC, which was an uh, interagency group to, to identify and understand what's happening more systemically in those markets and determine uh, ways to reduce uh, risk in financial markets and in firms overall. Um, there was a number of other things like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that was, uh, was formed and, and uh, uh, groups that help understand better what's happening overall in, in mar financial markets. But the Federal Reserve activities also changed as well. We picked up some additional supervisory responsibility for thrift holding companies and also for these systemically important firms. One of the big le lessons learned during the 2008 crisis were certainly some banks, some large banks that had issues, but there were financial firms that were really outside of the supervisory role of the Fed or anybody else that were not touched by regulators or supervisors. And the idea that these large financial firms could have um, tentacles really across the financial system, systemically important tentacles, that, boy, they ought to have somebody that is closer to those firms, that understands what's happening on an ongoing basis, rather than trying to figure out when, you're in, when they're in real trouble what's going on. So those systemically important firms have more of a supervisory regime associated with them. So now I want to turn to this picture again, and we've, we've talked about the framework, we've talked about the roles and responsibilities. I now want to touch on this concept of accountability. And just as the framers of the U.S. Constitutions took uh, great pains to create checks and balances to prevent abuses of power and to ensure the government stayed accountable to citizenry, the Federal Reserve Act provides some of these same checks. And you see that we talked about earlier, the role of the Congress in overseeing the Federal Reserve and this is answers one of those questions, is the Federal Reserve audited? And those of us who work there, we would say absolutely yes, multiple times in multiple ways. Uh, there's an annual independent audit that's done by the financial, of the financial statements of each reserve banks and the Board of Governors. We also have internal auditors, of course. And, you know, Congress understood that the flip side of independence is that the, uh, the Fed should be accountable to the public. The act also addresses this. As I mentioned, the Federal Reserve Board Chair testifies before Congress twice a year. 
and we provide under that same section written reports to Congress. And again, that audit of the financial statements. We're also subject to internal and external oversight authorities, one of which is the Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, which is a general government watchdog which conducts review of Federal Reserve activities. And the Federal Reserve itself maintains an independent audit office within the Fed called the Office of the Inspector General, which, which can and does conduct audits and investigations. In addition to these various forms of oversight, the boards and the reserve banks go to great lengths to voluntarily maintain transparency, which enhances our accountability to Congress and the public. And this is a picture from the website, which provides some pretty rich information related to our activities and um, with detailed explanations of those activities. In the world of transparency, the actions of the FOMC are now quite transparent. And those of you that have followed monetary policy for a number of years know that this is an evolution really over time. Um, the Fed FOMC provides a public policy statement describing its actions and its rationale immediately following each meeting. So uh, it's usually a Tuesday, Wednesday meeting. And Wednesday afternoon, there's a statement about what happened and why that happened. And then those meeting minutes, the details of what happened, are available about three weeks after a meeting. And now the Federal Reserve Chair is uh, every quarter meeting with the press right after those meetings and taking really any and all questions from the press um, about the, the meeting that took place previous. The FOMC materials that they consider, the green books and the blue books, are also available to the public on the website. And this voluntary transparency serves a number of really useful purposes. First, it's certainly educating the public on what the Fed is doing and why, but also making sure that the financial markets understand uh, and they receive the information they need to function properly. Federal Reserve principals, including the chair, governors, reserve bank presidents, and others, routinely provide public speeches outlining their views on the economy and shedding light and the insights on the workings of the Fed. We pictured here again our own President Nariana Coach Lakota, who is a frequent speaker throughout the 9th Federal Reserve District in the nation. And his speeches are always set out on the website. So it's another great source for what's happening in the district and what our uh, policymaker here in the 9th Federal Reserve District thinks. So I've given you a huge drink from the fire hose here about the Federal Reserve System. So I really appreciate you hanging in there. And you probably have some questions. So I want to make sure we cover those. Before I do, I want to cover some final remarks. And then we'll open it up. and. <laughs> Toby will take the questions and we'll, we'll talk with you. But I want to just summarize and say, you know, in 1913, some pretty forward-looking people uh, decided to take on this pretty formidable task of creating a central bank to bring greater safety and stability to America's economy. It's a pretty daunting task. And there really wasn't any big map to guide them. In a very American fashion, they put great energy into striking the right balance between a central authority and local autonomy, between national policy and regional diversity, between freedom of the marketplace and the need for tools to mitigate risks, and the need always for the central bank to be accountable to the public. In the Federal Reserve Act, I think they created a pretty good infrastructure that, to a remarkable degree, um, provides financial stability to the nation's economy and kept true to the principles of government. We have a central bank with a public purpose. Is it perfect? You know, it isn't. And in fact, I think the 2008 crisis illustrated the fact that the Fed and other regulators didn't really understand the depths of the vulnerabilities of financial system and the risks to consumers. The Fed's and others' responses to the crisis help avert catastrophe. I think things could have been a lot worse. Um, you know, studies that Bernanke looked at when he looked at the Great Depression, you know, we're talking about 25% unemployment. We got pretty close to 10 or right about 10% during the Great Recession. Could have been worse. We don't know the counterfactual, but certainly, the Federal Reserve took a number of actions, along with other private individuals, governments, and other the government and others, to try to deal with what was a significant crisis at the time. And, but also, the public has a right to expect that we can we should do what we can to try to avert further crises. The Dodd Frank Act contains structures and processes and and ways to help do that. But our work must continue and evolve to try to work forward to uh, enhance financial stability. Monetary policy also has its limits. And we have some really bright economists, economic policymakers, but they can't completely control the economy or its outcomes. We won't see the end of the business cycles or recessions anytime soon. But we have a foundation that we think serves us well as we face those economic wins. We have a governance and policy tools that help ensure the stability of our financial system, the integrity of the banking system, and efficient payment system for an increasingly global marketplace. 
and vitality for the economy. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. You are a lawyer. I assume there's a legal arm in the Fed. Yeah. What's the main purpose for that, your function? What, why is there such a thing? No, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so we do a number of different things. Uh, we're corporations, so we have 1,100 employees. Um, we have to develop hiring practices. Um, we comply with various laws, the Fed Family Medical Leave Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the various EEO laws. So a lot of the work we do is sort of counseling like you might see in any corporation. Uh, we also have contracts. So when we hire people to uh, help clean the bank or do the housekeeping or the, the greenery around here, um, provide uh, information technology services, all those sorts of things, I get to review all those contracts. Uh, so it's, it's a range of things you would see in any corporation. So that's, uh, we have information, uh, uh, intellectual property protection issues, uh, immigration issues occasionally, just that full range of things. The thing that's sort of unique to us that's, um, that's I think, particularly interesting are really two things. One is this world of regulation. So we supervise banks, and occasionally, as you might expect, banks don't always agree with our interpretation of the statutes or regulations. So one of the things we do is we help uh, the banking supervision area with some of those questions. Um, likewise, when there's questions in our payments areas, we're developing products or working with people in the payments functions, sometimes there's questions about whose fault was the fact that this payment didn't work like it was supposed to. The lawyers get involved in those kinds of questions. So there's really a, a wide range of things that we get involved in, and it's actually kept me around for, for 24 years. So thank you. Other questions? Um, the current president, I believe, has appointed the entire board at this time with four members. I don't know if that's happened before. Um, and with the makeup of the Federal Open Market Committee, there are five voting members and four board members uh, who may have different political uh, purposes in their motivations. Uh, do the five outvote the four at this point, or is there an accommodation for that? Yeah, so um, I'll try to, it's a, a good set of questions there that are embedded there. Well, the one thing I'll say is, um, and again, this is Neil Willardson speaking, not the Federal Reserve, but um, I think it's, it's, it's true that um, while board members are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, um, these folks are people that really don't have um, a, a political nature to them in general. I mean, having I've worked with some of them, I've had an opportunity to work for them. They're certainly appointed by a president, confirmed by the Senate, but people like uh, Chairman Bernanke, for example, professor at Princeton, um, not somebody that has political connections. Likewise, Janet Yellen, uh, professor at Berkeley, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So in general, they're not bringing a political, well, they're not at all bringing a political bent or orientation to their policy making. Instead, they're studied people, economists and others, uh, lawyers, there's a lawyer, the Dan Trullo, who's a very accomplished banking lawyer, professor, uh, accomplished practitioner, people that bring an academic perspective really principally to their role as policymakers. And then that balance from the Federal Reserve districts, um, you'll see that when you see their speeches. Um, it's a consensus process around that FOMC table. It's sort of a misnomer to say that they vote. They do vote, but ultimately, they begin with a discussion. So the goal isn't like when I think of the Supreme Court, you think of dissenting opinions and concurring opinions and majority opinions. It's really not like that. The goal around the table, I've never been there, but as I understand it, it's a process of building consensus, understanding what's happening in the economy, and coming out with a, with a perspective or an idea for what the policy should look like. So in that way, those different perspectives, while they may come there with somewhat different perspectives, they really bring a common view of ultimately what's good for the economy overall, and that's the principle that really guides them rather than a political affiliation at all. So. As the Fed provides liquidity to the system ultimately for the end-use end consumer, um, where does the Fed see its action with the private institutions as it's using as an intermediary when the banks hold or the financial institutions hold that liquidity uh, and do not do what the Fed purpose is, uh, them being private institutions. What is Fed policy around dictating what must be done or what, can, what it can and cannot do? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So the concern is, so we, we provide a lot of liquidity to the markets. 
and then the markets or the individual firms themselves don't then turn around and lend that money out. And you know, ultimately, um, it would probably be unsafe and unsound for the Fed to tell an institution to make a particular loan, as you might expect. At the same time, you know, banks and financial institutions are in it for, for profit. So you know, holding money in reserves is not making them very much. So you, you'd like to think that if economic conditions are such that there's good deals to be had, they're going to try to make those deals. And that's, that's what is, is tending to happen. I think you're seeing more and more economic activity. Their ability, um, they're not making much in their bond portfolios right now. They're going to make more money on loans. And you hope that they see that they can effectively manage those risks of those loans and that they're going to look for a higher level of profit on the funds that they have available. Over here. I'm not watching the time, by the way, so if we run late, you know, I can be here all night. So, you, you, uh, Carmen, you tell me if we're running tight. Well, you frequently use the term monetary policy, and I'm a little confused. And what is fiscal policy? Are those are two different yeah. things? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a very good question again. So, um, the Federal Reserve has nothing to do with fiscal policy. Let's start there. When you think of fiscal policy, it's basically government decisions. This is making choices about how we spend taxpayer money. So monetary policy has to do with the things I'm talking about is um, affecting how the economy works. Uh, fiscal policy is deciding to build a bridge or build a highway or put money towards a, a set of projects. That's fiscal policy, and that's decisions that are ultimately made by the Congress and the President. And Toby? Yeah. And taxes as well. Tax is another form of fiscal policy. This is the best part. I should have started with the questions. Does the Fed have any um, influence from the global economy or financial systems? And um, the Federal Reserve System, is that copied in any other f in financial uh, systems in the other parts of the world? I'll start with the second one. Um, pretty much every major economy has some form of central bank. What's unique about the Federal Reserve is this regional structure. Most of them have more of a central authority. The regional approach, the 12 Federal Reserve banks, the influence of the local presidents in that monetary policy process, that's, that's pretty unique to the Federal Reserve system. Um, the role of the Fed the, the focus of the FOMC is not on the global economy. Um, they're focused on this nation's economy. On the other hand, um, certainly during times of the crisis, there was coordination, there was discussions among the major central banks, and on an ongoing basis, there's discussions among the central banks. But the focus of our monetary policy is on, on the U.S. or national economy. And Toby, did I say anything that I shouldn't have or that you'd like to add to? Okay. You often hear the term that uh, the Fed is printing money. What does that mean? I was expecting that question, and this is one I'm going to turn over to Toby. So when uh, in the old days, there were printing presses that printed out linen and cotton into currency. And so that was the Fed printing money, literally printing money. Now to increase the money supply. Now we're increasing the money supply, but we're not necessarily doing it with printing presses. The amount of currency in circulation hasn't increased that much. It's more us uh, having bank accounts with the banks, and those bank accounts are getting larger. So in, in, in essence, there's increased amount of us providing liquidity and money out there, but not necessarily in the form of currency notes, but in the form of balances in in people's checking accounts. Uh, how is it determined that uh, this that this Fed, this Reserve Bank would uh, be the exclusive uh, function for the ACH uh, system or service, yeah. and how does that how did it uh, affect the um, overall operations of this bank versus others, um, they. Yeah, and I'll, I'll speak about that one in particular, but also more generically, um, 
you know, like other financial institutions, you realize with the use of technology and the ability to um, uh, become more efficient that it didn't make sense to have operations of the same type in every Federal Reserve District. When I first started here, uh, we had a, a mainframe computer in every Federal Reserve Bank in, in the early 1990s. And so we've consolidated large parts of our information technology processes and networks. Uh, in the same way, other aspects of our operations like the ACH function or the Treasury retail securities function have been consolidated to one or in some cases two reserve banks for redundancy. We provide services to uh, financial institutions through, through what's called a customer contact center. That's managed out of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, but we're the second site for that operation. So when people from a financial institution in New Jersey call, they're either going to get Kansas City or Minneapolis, but they're not going to get somebody from the New York Fed. It's pretty expensive to hire call center people in Manhattan, so you probably don't want to have call center people there. It's better off having them here in Minneapolis or Kansas City. So that really gets to the decision-making process around consolidation. It probably makes more sense to have some of those operational functions here in the upper Midwest where rents are cheaper, uh, and, you know, employment uh, wages are probably a bit lower than in California or New York. And so that's how we've when making those decisions, it often follows almost an internal bid process. In fact, it does in many cases follow an internal bid process. We put forward what we would uh, uh, what we would cost the system, and that's part of the evaluation process and determining where those particular activities would take place. But more and more, with respect to those financial services activities, they're not taking place certainly in 12 banks. They're probably in one or two or perhaps three reserve banks, depending on the need for redundancy. Oh, I was uh, just curious to know what is uh, you know, what would be the main driver of of a liquidity problem, uh, be, needing to provide liquidity to member banks at at so many different times. That yeah, okay, no, and that's so in the normal course, and, and it's um, if you looked at our discount window lending today, for example, tonight. Um, it could be as low as $50,000, and probably is. And it's much like um, if you have a, a short-term need for credit, you, your, your uh, bank has um, a need for dollars because a customer came in that day and wanted 25 grand or 50,000, and you needed funds available to make those available to those particular customers on a short-term basis. So it's... It's much like you might need a, a, a quick loan um, from your line of credit. In the same way, we provide sort of a brief line of credit that's secured by assets with legal agreements with the institution to allow them to borrow from the Fed on an overnight basis. It's paid back usually the next day or the next day or two, and we get an interest rate, the primary credit rate typically, on those overnight lendings. More often, and when we think of liquidity role of the Federal Reserve, it's at a time when there's disruptions in the financial markets. And a good example goes back to September 11, 2001. Because there were a lot of connections to the payment system in Manhattan and in the World Trade Center, there were a number of problems with the transmission networks between financial institutions. And firms that normally got funds from other firms weren't able to get that money. And so they came to the Federal Reserve Banks and said, you know, this my normal trading partner, my private trading partner for funds, overnight funds, isn't available. Federal Reserve, stock markets, remember, and the financial markets were all closed down for almost a full week. Federal Reserve stepped in and provided short-term funding, again, with collateral that was, was in place with us or put in place with us on a very short-term basis to allow for lending so that those firms could provide um, uh, funds to meet their short-term obligations overnight. And again, those are repaid in pretty short order. So those are a couple examples, both on an ongoing basis and, uh, and in more severe cases of liquidity. If you want to follow up, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I can understand that there would be some kind of an obligation that, that needs to be met to keep some kind of a ratio at a certain level. Uh, and you need an, in, you need an injection, but uh, people wanting to take out loans, I mean, th that can go to infinity. 
I mean, is there any kind of a, a limiting marker on the ability to do that? And aside just from the desire to, to borrow money, what is, I mean, what actually is, is the cause? I, I mean, I, I'm not really getting, yeah. getting what that comes from. Um, I'm trying to think of what would be easier to answer the question in terms of the normal course or in the case of more of a severe liquidity issue, which would be better for me to start with. Um, like the normal course, for example, let me go back to this ag lending uh, part of, of uh, so we can provide seasonal credit to small institutions. And imagine a case where um, uh, farmers in a, that are going to a small bank, a $10 million bank, and they say, you know what, I'd like to borrow uh, $100,000. And several farmers come in and say, I'm planting now. I need money to plant. That institution might not have the money at the time because they have outstanding loans that are basically Ill illiquid. So their assets are outstanding loans that are illiquid. And you wouldn't expect they have another farmer that has a million dollar loans that they would liquidate that money so that they could in turn make a loan. Instead, they say, you know what, Federal Reserve, for a short period of time, probably for a couple of months, until that farmer comes back in with their, their corn and their beans, um, I'd like to borrow from you first for a short period of time so I can lend money to those farmers so that then when they harvest, they'll pay back. So that, in that way, again, it's an unusual case. Seasonal lending doesn't take place for a lot of institutions, but for a few, that's a case where we would do that. Now, those banks could probably go to maybe a big bank in New York to get the same kind of funding. But do you really want them to go through that process? And maybe they don't have those kinds of connections to do so. So that's probably, let's go ahead, Toby. Um, you can't go into infinity as well because they provide collateral for the loans. In other words, they provide their securities to get a loan from us. Yeah, and the, the security could also be in the form of their other loans. And again, this goes back a little bit to the George Bailey my impression of earlier of Jimmy Stewart, and that is banks are funded and they have, they have long-term assets. So they have loans in somebody else's house that are maybe 15 or 30 year loans, although banks typically don't own, own home loans, but bear with me on that. If you expect them to liquidate those assets, you know, they're not gonna be able to get very much for those loans because someone's not willing to buy those in sort of a, in, in, in particular markets, and why do you want them to? Instead, again, Going back to the role, the discount window role, um, it's most acute in problems like 2008 or like the 2001 situation where there's disruptions in the market. It's the unusual case, and even though we talked about it here, it's a pretty unusual case where we're getting frequent lending from a particular institution. It's really the rare case. Let's maybe one back over. You want to meet? Her? That's the wrap up. That is the wrap up signal. Okay. Signal, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. I know this was uh, some pretty in depth discussion. We had about forty eight slides, and you really hung in there with me today. I'm going to stick around for a while. If there's further questions, I really appreciate everybody coming here tonight. I know you had other options for tonight. It was a beautiful day, so thanks for coming into the Federal Reserve. And please uh, feel free to contact me or talk with me after today. And I'll try to answer some more of your questions. I think Toby's going to stick around as well. Thank you.